just haven't had the liberty yet. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to start reading verse 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revel revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. We'll stop reading right there. I believe that's everything that I was needing to read. The thought that I kind of had is just look at the fruits of the Spirit. You've got two different sets if you want to get technical. One is we're going to look at the carnal side. I want to look at that first just to almost do a compare and contrast. Now I'll admit, some of these will make me very uncomfortable. I'd be lying if I said they didn't. Verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. For the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, Let's look first at adultery. I'm sure most of us are familiar with this. Most of us are adults. So we know that adultery is basically a sexual relation with anybody that is not his or her spouse. In Matthew 5, verse 28, it says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart. Next we're going to look at, it's in verse 19, after adultery, we have fornication. Fornication, this is when a, any unmarried person commits any sort of sexual act outside of the marriage bonds. This includes the thoughts as well, just like uh, what we just read about the Lord Jesus Christ when he was saying for somebody to look on a woman to lust after them, for somebody that's not married, that still constitutes as fornication as well. Next, we're going to look at you have uncleanness. At first, this one almost didn't make sense to me, and, and I'll admit that because I realized that the first two are obviously sexual acts. And then when I looked at the one following, that's a sexual act as well. So when I looked at uncleanness, like I said, it didn't make sense to me. And then I got to think about it for a little bit, and upon further thinking, it, it kind of clicked. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 20, and I'll show you what I believe that this is making a reference to. there we're going to start reading verse number 10 and the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death in verse number 10 we can see the adultery part then we can look at in verse 11 it says and the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness both of them shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them. Verse 11, you have a son that's messing with his stepmother, which is disgusting when you think about it. But sadly, it continues to get even worse. In verse 12 it says, And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. In verse 12, you have a man, he's messing with his daughter-in-law. That's disturbing when you really think about it. In 13, it, like I said, it continues to get even worse and worse as you go further and further down. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. In verse 13, you have the homosexuality movement. And sadly, it's going rampant even today. They're trying to force it on even our youth even today uh, in schools. They're trying to teach these kids younger and younger about this stuff, and they have no business knowing about it. That's right. Verse 14 says, If a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire. 
both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. Verse 14, you have a man with his wife and her mother. That's, like I said, it continues to get worse and worse. Next we're going to look at verses 15 and 16. It says, And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. Verse 16, And if a woman approach unto a beast, or any beast, and lie down thereto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Verse 15 and 16, Here we have bestiality. Then we go to verse 17. Like I said, it continues to get worse and worse all the way through. It says, And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. Verse 17, you have basically incest. This is family with family. And what's so sad, when you really think about it, God had to tell them that they shouldn't do this stuff. Which makes you think, which I'm under the impression, that the pagan philosophies at, in that time, they was committing each and every one of these acts. It would probably disturb us to realize just how many of these exact acts are actually going on in America today. That's disturbing to think about. And it, it should break your heart when you think about it. That's personally what I believe it's referring to when it talks about uncleanness. There could be a double meaning just just in general just anything that's going against God but like I said that's what I'm personally under the conviction of that that's what it's making reference to Let's see verse 19 I believe it is after uncleanness we have lasciviousness this is what I understand is extreme sexual desires or lust the best example I could think of would be those that are addicted to pornography they can't seem to get away from it. They're so addicted to it, they're thinking about it all the time. They can't get away from it. And without the supernatural uh, help of the Lord, you won't get away from it. This flesh will go to it and it will not get away from it. That's just how power its grip is on mankind. Now we're going to go to verse number 20. We can look at idolatry. Most of these are going to be very simple and self-explanatory. Idolatry is worshiping of anything that isn't God, that could be statues, that's stones, that's images, that's even nature, such uh, things such as the sun, things as the moon. It's like now, even today, we've got TVs in our living room. We've got it, we get so glued on it, we don't think about the things of God. We're just watching anything and everything that comes across, and we get to where we don't think about the things of God. We neglect our Bible reading, we neglect uh, our prayer. We, Neglect our relationship with the Lord, and it's, it's sad we can turn anything into an idol. Idolatry. Next we have witchcraft. This is a practice of witches or sorcery, also known as magic. Harry Potter is one of the most relevant ones of today. All these books, they're encouraging all these this witchcraft, things that's going against God. We know that we should stay away from stuff like this, but this flesh, it just wants to go to it, it wants to consume it be it read it and watch movies about it. Next you have hatred. It's an extreme dislike for someone. Next you have variance. This is a disagreement or a quarrel, somebody in conflict. Then you have emulations. This is competitive rivalry or jealousies. Wrath. This is violent anger. Then you have strife. This is exertion or contention for superiority. Then you have sedition. Somebody that's causing division, especially from leadership. You have heresies. This is the false doctrines, people just false teachings in general that is not true in any sort of a matter. You have envying. This is when uh, you get mad when something good happens to somebody else. You can't be happy or excited because somebody gets a nice car or a nice home. You're so mad because the Lord blessed them in whatever way that it is. You have murder. This is when you kill somebody after meditating or thinking about it. In 1 John 3.15, the first part of the verse says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. What a thought. To hate somebody would make you qualify as a murderer. Then you have drunkenness. This is where we like to think it's somebody that just consumes strong alcoholic drink. And they uh, lose control of their body and their mind. But I want you to know that all sorts of drugs would qualify as drunkenness. Be it meth, cocaine, heroin, 
uh, all of these would consider as, be considered as drunkenness because you're not in your right mind. Then you have rebellions. This one took me a little bit to kind of get my mind around it. But the way I understood it is it's to feast with loose or clamorous or noisy partying. Or partying. The way of some of the stuff I read suggests this is you have these parties, there's, bit, there's drunkenness, there's drugs, there's alcohol, there's even fornication gets involved with all of these. And what's interesting is, if I counted right, I believe there's 17 of these that are mentioned. We don't know all of them because I, let's see if I can find it. I'll read verse 21 just to kind of show you what I noticed. It says, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. That means there's more. We don't know how many more. It could be hundreds. We just, we don't know. But that's disturbing when you really think about it. And all these are just the bit of lust of the flesh, the fruits of our flesh. That's what it wants to do. What I really want to get into is the fruits of the Spirit. This is, starts off in verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Just think about that. We can read in uh, Romans 5.8, it says, but God committeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What better example of love could we look at than the love of God that He had for all of mankind? He loved us so much that He was willing to give His only begotten Son for each and every one of us. It's not God's desire to, for each and every one of us to die and go to hell. That's not His desire at all. That's why He was willing to give His best. He showed His love for us. Another form of love is to uh, deeply care about another person. Another great example is, think about a mother, a love for her child. She's willing to sacrifice anything for that child, be it a meal or even the best that she's got. A mother's love is just such an amazing and beautiful picture. Next you have joy. This is to rejoice, to be glad, to exult. In Luke 15, 10, it says, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. What a blessing to think about that. God, He shows the trait of joy. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to see God full of joy or excitement? Just think about that. And I believe every time that somebody gets saved, the Lord, He shows joy in the presence of the angels. He shows them how they should be excited, how they should be praising of somebody that it said repent. But to repent is to turn away from. That's be it, to turn away from sins, to turn away from this fleshly desire. Just to think about that. It's such a blessing to really think about. Just knowing that you don't have to go to hell if you're saved. That should give each and every one of us joy. Just that little statement by itself. We've got something to be happy about. We don't have to die and burn in the devil's hell. It was made for the angels that turned away from God. They left their first love. I believe that's in Jude. But through the Lord, you can have peace. You can have joy. And next, we're going to look at peace. This is freedom from disturbance or agitation. A state of, or of quiet or tranquility. It's like even when things are going sideways, you can have a peace. I believe, I can't remember where it is. Talks about a peace that surpasses all understanding. You may have a, a loss of a loved one. You may have cancer. You may have somebody that you love that has cancer who's going through what feels like the worst trial that they've ever went through. It's like they can have a peace. They can have a joy that even though they're going through what feels like hell on earth, that they can still have a peace knowing that everything's going to be all right. They've still got hope. They know it's, it's going to be a better day. Reading uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 through 8 says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto, the, unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, 
whatsoever things are good or of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. I believe yeah, verse number seven says, In the peace of God which passeth all understanding. Like I said, you can be going through troubles, you can be going through trials, things that you may not understand, but you can have a peace that there's going to be a better day coming. We can have peace knowing that we're going to have a glorified body one of these days. I love to imagine not having any troubles in this flesh, having perfect control of my mind, not having to worry about having a thought come through and then have to automatically go, Lord, please forgive me. I can't believe that thought just went through my head. That's how great our God is. And He can give all of these to us. Next we're going to look at long-suffering. This is a person that is not easily provoked. The best example I can think of is, like I said, going back to the Lord, just think about some of the traits of God. Numbers 14, verse 18. says, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Who can you think of that's more long-suffering than God? He forgives us of our sins. He's willing to forgive us whenever we mess up, to give us a second and third and fourth chance. What a God. What, just the long-suffering. Another example, I believe this is David. In uh, Psalms chapter 86, verses 13 through 17. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. It's a good spot to stop and shout. O God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of violent men have sought after my soul, and have not set thee before them. Verse 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious long-suffering and plenteous in mercy. Turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. Show me a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because thou, Lord, hast holpen me and comforted me. What a God. Just to think how he is so merciful he could easily pronounce judgment for any sin that we do when we mess up. But God, in His infinite wisdom that we may not ever truly understand, He gives us chance after chance to make things right. For us just to ask for forgiveness, to repent, to have a turning away from, turn from sin and not going back to it, to have a change of mind. You know, the word repent it used to throw me for a loop because you read in the Old Testament to talk about how the Lord repented of the evil he had thought. Initially, I thought that meant asking for forgiveness, but then upon further looking at it, it's, it's a change of mind. Had he pronounced judgment against Israel the first time he got mad, Israel wouldn't be here today. It's been said if God and Moses would have got mad at Israel on the same day, they wouldn't be here either. It's funny to think about. Next, we have gentleness. This is softness of manners, mildness of temper, sweetness of disposition, or meekness. We have uh, King David here in 2 Samuel chapter 22, I think, verse 33 through 39 says, God is my strength and power. He maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet, and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken in mine arms. Thou hast given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, so that my feet did not slip. I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them, and turned not again until I have had consumed them. And I have consumed them and wounded them, that they could not arise, and they are fallen under my feet. What I want to look at is in verse 36, it's towards the last part. This is David say, saying, And thy gentleness hath made me great. Think about that. The gentleness of God is what made him so great. Just to really think about that. Dwell on it. He didn't say it was the mercies of God that made him great. It was God's gentleness that made him great. God showing mercy. Because like I said, he could have 
beat him down just whenever he messed up. He could have judged his sin, but the Lord showed him mercy over and over again. Another way to think about gentleness is think about somebody taking care of a newborn. You can't just throw the child around as much as you want to. You got to be gentle. You got to take care of him because that child cannot take care of himself, no matter how much he wants to. It can be easily hurt. You got to be gentle. Next, we're going to look at goodness. This is kindness, benevolence, benignity of heart, or more general, generally, acts of kindness, charity, humanity exercised. I shall remember his goodness to me with gratitude. In Psalms 107, verse 15, it says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Just think about that. We should praise God for his goodness. Now, I've wrote down a couple examples, just how the Lord's been good to even me, good to all of us if we think about it. He gave us life. Let's start with that. That's, he didn't have to. He couldn't just let us rot. He gives us our health. He gives us strength, the ability to get up, to eat, to take care of ourselves, to go take a shower, to go and work. He gives us a good church that we can come to to be able to worship God. He gave us His Word. He puts people around us that are praying for us, that are concerned with us about our well-being. He gives us hope. Just think about that. And that's just a few. There are so many more things that we could thank God for because He's good to us. His mercy endureth forever. He didn't have to put us in the greatest nation on this earth. He didn't have to give us His Word so we can read it. Just to think about it, I don't remember who I was talking to this week, but if we do what God tells us to, He'll give us rewards so we can give to Him. What a God. For us doing what we should do, He'll reward us for doing that. That's a God, the God that we serve. He's such an amazing God. He's powerful. Such an amazing God. Then you have the Hall of Faith. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. We'll start reading verse 1, and it pretty well defines it in verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Now we're going to jump into verse 5. It says, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse 6, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The first person that I will look at is Enoch. But think about the testimony that he had, that he pleased God. Just think about that for a moment. Just imagine that you're so close to God you're, with your relationship. You're, I imagine he's talking to God every day. He's seeking the Lord in prayer. He's trying to read what he can and just trying to grow and learn even more. Then just one day he's walking with the Lord, he's talking to him, and next thing you know, the Lord just takes him on up to be with him forever. It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of the church that one of these days, whenever the Lord's done with us, he's going to call the church home to be with him. Not all of us are going to have to die just to think about that day. It's going to be an amazing day whenever the Lord just comes and calls His children on home to be with Him forever. It's a beautiful picture. We can read in John 14, 1-3. through 3, says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. God made that promise. He said if he was going to leave, he'll come back. He didn't tell us exactly when he was going to come back. He just promised he would. Next we're going to look at Noah. It's in verse 7. It says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen, 
as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Just imagine that you're in Noah's shoes for a moment. And all of a sudden you have God come to you and says, I want you to build an ark or a big boat. What's your first thought? What's a boat? It seems like a good start. Just think about it. He had enough faith whenever God told him to build this ark or boat that he was willing to do it. I love the phrasing that says that he moved with fear. We don't know if this was be it fear for his life or fear for judgment. I, I don't know which. It could probably be a mesh of the two. But he had enough faith in God that he'd done exactly what God told him to do. Had he not, who's to say if mankind would be on this earth here today? Would he have found somebody else? It's possible. But because he moved with fear, because he went and he built the ark anyway, he was able to save his entire family. That was him, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. That's showing faith. All oh, that we had faith like that today, that we would do what God told us to do without trying to argue with God saying, I don't get it, I don't understand. Next we're going to look at meekness. This is strength under control. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. I'm going to stop right there for a moment. It didn't just say that he was a meek man. It elaborated just a little bit. It says, above all the men which are upon the face of the earth. Think about that compliment for a moment. He was given credit for being the meekest man in the entire earth. What we know about Moses is he was a very smart man, no doubt. He was raised under or in Pharaoh's house. So I imagine that he probably would have had the highest education that he probably could have gotten. So that's what makes me think he was a very smart man. But we can read in Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 through 12, it says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. And in verse 12 it says, And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Not only do we see that he's probably very educated, but in a moment of time, he had such love and compassion for his own people. When he saw one of his people getting hit, he reacted. It was probably justified in his opinion, but he reacted by killing the ones that took part in hitting him. He probably had the right heart in mind defending his people. But it's been said that he was getting ahead of God because immediately after this, he had to go and flee to the other side of the desert. And he was there for 40 years before the Lord came back to him to call him back into Egypt. And even after that, after he went back to the Jews in Egypt to bring them out, I imagine that he was probably preaching to nearly 2 million people by what I figured. Trying to lead them, having them follow the commandments of the Lord. The law, the book, just think about it. Just going through history and trying to help them glean and learn and grow closer to God and try to fulfill the will of God. Just to think about that. How meek that you would have to be. I can't help but think that a pastor would probably understand this role probably like Moses would have. You care so much about the congregation, the people. You try to go out of your way to try to help them, to encourage them to live right, to live a better life, and then just to see them lift their nose up to you and walk away. I imagine that's probably how Moses felt. Because over and over again, they kept turning their face against God. They kept rebelling. They wondered why judgment kept coming to them over and over again. Then we're going to look at the last one. We're going to look at temperance. It references two things in this definition. The, one, or the first is in appetite. This is somebody that's not overeating or over drinking, indulging in food and stuff. And the other one is in calmness or patience, keeping this flesh under control. 
Nobody said that it was going to be easy to keep this flesh under control. I'll admit I've got spots where I struggle with, and I'll probably struggle with those for the rest of my life. But it also shows us why that one, yes, it's very easy to try to give into this flesh, but it's also extremely important for us to be careful who we allow ourselves to hang around, who your friends are, who your influences are, the people that you read from, the people you listen to. It's very important to kind of guard yourself to, because if you put yourself around people that's constantly getting into fights, you're going to be tempted to try to get in those fights as well. I believe there's a spot in uh, Proverbs. I can't remember the exact quote right off the top of my head, though. But kind of in uh, wrapping this up, it's going to be hard for a Christian to fulfill each and every one of these, and there's no denying that. What I personally believe is the only way that you'll be able to fulfill all nine of these fruits of the Spirit is to uh, be careful in your relationship with God. That's your prayer life, that's your reading life, the constantly being in God's Word, being under the preaching, being under the teaching, truly being in God's Word. I believe that's the only way you'll be able to come close to fulfilling all these fruits of the Spirit. Because without it, I don't believe there's any way that you could. And the last verse we'll read, it's in Galatians 5, verse 16, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's just a good warning right there. If you're trying to be careful of your spiritual walk with God, if you're constantly thinking about the things of God, you're meditating on God's Word, it's going to be a lot harder for you just to fall into the lust of the flesh because you're constantly feeding your mind. You're dwelling on the things of God. We'll go ahead and close right there. Does anybody have any questions before we dismiss? All right. Brother Robin, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Yeah. Lord, thank you so much for the Sunday school hour. Lord, thank you for all you show us in your word. Lord, I pray you bless in the service today. Lord, I pray for the all souls. Thank you so much for this church. Jesus, for your glory. Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.